All right, the recording is in progress. We've got Mr. Scott McAllister here. He's going to give us a talk on Flexbox and CSS Grid. Uh, Scott, the floor is yours, my friend. Take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Nolan. And before I actually get rolling, I want to add my endorsement to uh, speaking at, at user groups. Speaking at user groups, meetup groups is how I got started with speaking. And it's where I learned that I actually liked it. I actually liked standing up in front of a group. I liked talking about a new thing. And I'm going like this because I, when you're standing in front of a group, you're like pointing up to the, the screen behind you. And I loved it. And so I've actually transitioned that over many years into this is what I do for work most of the time. So that's uh, highly, highly uh uh, awesome opportunity and great to have folks like Nolan and Bill who put groups like this together because uh, the these types of groups need folks like you to a come but b also uh, to speak so it's it's uh, it's a great great opportunity uh, so but enough with that plug uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about something that's near and dear to my heart and that's something called CSS Grid and Flexbox. You might have heard of one or the other, most likely probably heard of Flexbox, uh, maybe, and maybe not so much CSS Grid, but putting them together, that's where things get kind of interesting. To give you an idea or a general plan of what we're gonna be doing today and how we're gonna go about this, this uh, time that we have together, I'm gonna start out talking about CSS from the very beginnings and just kind of lay the groundwork. It might seem pretty basic up at first. You're thinking, oh goodness, I've seen all this before. Just wanna make sure that I wanna level set with everybody, knowing where we started as far as HTML and CSS, and then ramp us up and, and then talking about Flexbox and CSS Grid. So when the internet came around back in the day, I was even on earth, believe it or not. And uh, folks who created it were essentially professors at universities and they wanted to share their research with, with each other, with their peers, with the world. And they didn't have a whole lot of need for making special fancy interfaces. They didn't need a lot of styling. And so when HTML came around, it had a little bit of styling, just enough to make the research readable. And it, you, you follow the HTML tags from top to bottom and you see a little bit of a, some headers and you see some lists and you see some paragraphs and things like that. And they're all wrapped in HTML tags. This is something called normal flow. I knew this as a thing. I knew this as HTML without styles basically, uh, but didn't know that it was called normal flow until you know the last few years when I was looking into the history of all this stuff. And so with normal flow, it's, it covered what the professors wanted. It got the, the research papers into a digital space, made it so that you could read them and separate out some of the information a little bit to make it just a touch more readable. However, as the internet became a lot more widely used, more than just for research papers, I don't know if any of us have looked at a research paper on the internet in the last, I don't know, unless you're in school right now. And so, it's used for a lot more things. Our interfaces have become a lot more complex and a lot more needing to keep our attention. We need to keep the attention of our users. If we don't, they're gonna click away and go do something else if they can't find their information quickly. So we have a few different ideas that we have to make styling and make styling make sense. At the base of all these is the box model. Now the box model is, that is essentially saying that everything in our HTML and our CSS has a box, has a height, has a width, has a border, has margin, has padding. Now be honest, how many of you get confused on which is margin and which is padding? Right, right? I always did until this. You were never gonna forget this. If, if okay, I'm gonna represent a box, all right? So my skin is my border, this is the margin out here outside my skin. All that stuff inside, that's your padding. You're welcome. You're never going to forget that now. All right. So your padding is on the inside, margins on the outside. So with that box model, we've got some ideas of how to position some things. And the first thing we want to talk about is floating. Now, floating is how we take our HTML elements and we throw them either left or right, usually to the right, right? Because everything in normal flow is hanging out on the left. 
and we can wrap some text around it and let, let's look at some code. But so with floats, things were getting there. We could position things a little bit more than just straight down the left side of the page, but it had some quirks, right? So let's pop out of here real quick because who doesn't love live coding? Uh, da, 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 da. Don't stop my share. All right, so here what we're gonna do is I'm gonna have um, some demonstration code here. It's all gonna use similar HTML elements. So I have an HTML page that essentially has a container and then we have five children elements as I'll call them that are sitting right inside that container. In our case here, and is the resolution okay, or should we, do we want to bump it up a little bit on the code? It's good. Um, I can see it okay. Okay. Any, if anyone needs it bumped up, let me know. I'm happy to increase it yeah. a touch. Yeah, folks, uh, throw comments, and if you need something changed, throw that in the chat, and I'll read the stuff to Scott. If uh, Yeah, let me know, because I don't see the chat real well when I'm yep. going full screen. Yeah. Got you. Awesome. Appreciate it. So with this, we have our basic HTML. We have a, a div with our container. We have five items on the inside. Right here, we have those five items, and that's nice. We want our items to sit here. So if I have a couple of classes here, I have my left class and my right class. They're just gonna float things to the left or the right. And so with down here, if I wanted to float, say this uh, number three, or number three right here, I'm gonna float that to the right. So I'm gonna give it the right class, save it, and our three floats off to the right, goes to the farthest it possibly can inside the container, but then it also loses its space on the left-hand side of the page. And so it's like, all right, uh, that's nice. I, I went to the right-hand side of the page, but uh, what happens if I float like number four to the right? Okay, if I write float number four to the right, oh, it goes to the right-hand side of the page. It also loses its spot. And that's not that cool. So I'm gonna keep this here. I'm gonna leave those where it's going. We're gonna put four back in line. But then we don't want number three to lose its spot. So what we wanna do, if we want, don't want number three to lose its spot, we can do something called clear. And in this idea, clear does one of two things. If you say clear both, it's gonna clear left and right. Or you can say clear left or clear right. I have never in all of my years of web development used anything else besides clear both. Maybe someone has, maybe Nolan has, maybe one of you all have, I've never done it. However, so if we wanna sit there and have clear here, so the clear class is on number four, it's applying this clear both attribute. And here, it now makes it so that the floating is cleared, it's done. and three is over off on the right-hand side. Neat, nifty. It's styling that we apply to a single element. We have to apply that styling to each different element inside of our container. So if I wanna float number three, I have to apply that float style to number three. If I wanna float number four, I apply it to number four, but I'm thinking very individually here. You're thinking when you're buying floats that things are just happening one by one and not in conjunction with each other. So we had floats for a while, and then this positioning. We'll go full screen just to see everything here. But so with positioning, this gives us a little bit more control. We have a little bit more control over what we're doing, not just floating things to the left and right, but we're actually gonna position things either relative to their spot in the container or their spot in the HTML. Absolutely, in, on that page, fixed or sticky. So sticky is an interesting one. It's one that uh, definitely comes into play a lot more often now that we have big pages that we're trying to fit on small screens. And so let's look at how these things, uh, how our different positioning attributes can work together. So I'll come here, come out of that. We have our position code. And all of this code I'm going through today is available in a GitHub repo that I'll share the, the code at the end. So you can take it and play with it and see how it works inside it. You know, you can see how it works, not on like a production project or something like that. So with this position idea, we're gonna have a little bit bigger of a container and we have our five or six, in this case, we're gonna use six elements and we're gonna see how these different position attributes work. In our case here, I have my container, I have my item, 
We have a relative class set up to use the relative position. We're gonna color it red. So in this case, I'm gonna take number three here and I'm gonna call it relative and we're gonna see where this lands. So number three kicks over down a little bit to the right a little bit. If we come up to our attributes on relative, it's 10 pixels from the top, 80 pixels left. 10 pixels from the top of its original position where it was sitting in normal flow, that's where relative is. It's relative to its original position. Now with absolute, let's apply absolute to number five. And when our, with our absolute class, we have the position absolute here. It's also using 10 pixels top, 80 pixels left. So it's a lot of the same settings that we have for this element. But look, it gets not just sits in the line and, and does from 10 and 80 to the left from its original spot. It actually goes 10 down from the HTML page and 80 on the left of the HTML page. It could also do it inside of the container if the container has a certain attribute, which I'm forgetting at the, this particular moment. However, in our case, this is in relation to the HTML page because this is where it sits on uh, the page. It's absolute, it won't ever change. It's sitting right there at the top of our HTML page. And then with our sticky one, sticky gets interesting here. So we say sticky, I'm gonna look over here to this position, the position sticky, the top is 20, and then we're gonna make it blue. So I'm gonna come over here, look at my code, and my number one turned to blue, but it didn't move. Because sticky keeps the element in the exact same spot where it needs, wherever it began. And then it actually says, all right, in this case, I'm gonna make sure that when this page moves, where someone scrolls down this page, that it actually stays in that spot. So it stays in the spot where it's 20 pixels from the top. It leaves that 20 pixel space from the top and leaves it there as you scroll down. Super handy when you're doing mobile interfaces, when you're doing na uh, uh, nav bars that go across the top of the page there that need to stay on the top of the page there. And then you, you scroll back up and it you know locks back into place. That's where the, the places where I've used that a lot. So that's where some of the ideas we have with positioning. But again, thinking about floats, it's a little bit more powerful than floating but you're still talking about each element individually. You have to think about, okay, how am I positioning this in relation to itself? But then I have to think about all those positions individually in relation to each other. So I don't, I can't just say, okay, let's position all these in relation in, as a big group. That'd be really nice, wouldn't it? So expanding from positioning, we think about display. Now with display, there's a lot of different elements on display. Tonight, we're only gonna talk about two. And that's our flex and our grid display. It, these are when you start thinking about things in your container and how it relates to the items on the inside, the group of items. We're gonna be talking about all the items in a layout rather than individually, just like how we were talking about with the positioning and the floating. We wanna think about all of those items in a collection and how they relate to each other inside of the container. So in flex, we can pop out of our slides here. Let's go look at flex. We have a flex demo right there. And now with flex, I have the flex display here. My container now is where I'm gonna be setting up most of our, most of our styling. Most of our CSS is gonna be happening on this container. So we have this container here where we have our five elements. And inside that container, we have, we set this display of flex. And in this case, doesn't do a whole lot yet because we haven't told it to do anything yet. However, if we wanted to set a, a few of the different attributes, this would start making things look uh, a little more different. In this case, we have a, an attribute called flex direction. Now with flex direction, the default is row. So when I set it to row, I reload, it's staying there. However, if I go to column, not Rockalo, typing in front of people, even on Zoom is still hard. All right, so we come here, 
I can say column and now suddenly all my elements are going down the column on the left hand side of my container. They're going down the container, sorry, in a column. And so in my column, I can say that's nice, that's cool. And uh, I could take something like, let's see, column. The other thing we could do is we could say column reverse. And in this case, we could take all of our elements and stack them on top of each other. One reason I could do think about doing this is possibly like a countdown of some type of thing. Like maybe if you have a mobile interface and a mobile layout and you're starting to go in and you start popping things down, that's what uh, something you could do with your, with your column reverse. You could also take that same idea and make it a row reverse. So in our case here, we have five, four, three, two, one, starting from the left, which is our flex start, right? That's where our position is. And this is honestly how a lot of, if you were gonna take all these different items and float them to the right, this is what it would have looked like, right? If you have a lot, lots of floating happening all at once. But instead of sitting there and saying, okay, I need to float one, float two, float three, four, and five, you just say flex direction, row reverse, done. There's no other styles applied to the items at all. All right, so with flex direction, let's put it back into flex row. And let's talk about flex wrapping a little bit. Now with wrapping, let's not do wrap reverse just yet. With flex wrapping, I have this here. These will start wrapping because we have on the items, they have a width of 150 and a height set. And so when we start bringing that interface in or bringing that window in, those items are gonna start knocking down the page a little bit. Come back out, the items will kick right back up into that row and stay that 150 pixels wide, even while your page goes in and out. We could do a wrap reverse. You can guess what this will possibly do when we looked at our column reverse and our row reverse. If I take my wrap reverse here, reload my page. Now, when I go, you see my four and five actually go up. So here we have our one, two, three, four, and five. I come in narrowing and then my five goes to the top. My four goes up, my five, my three. And there we go. And now we have a column reverse made with that wrap reverse. And here we also could do, I believe there's a no wrap. No wrap. Okay. In our no wrap, it actually ignores the 150, or at least until you get to the spot where it gets to 150, then it won't go any bigger. But once it hits 150 for each of those items, it squeezes all the elements so that they just fit and they're not gonna wrap. They're not gonna wrap at all. They'll just stay there and they'll get kind of squishy. All right. And then we have justified content. Justify content. With justify content, this is when you start thinking about Flexbox. And this is where I started using Flexbox. I started using Flexbox on nav bars actually, which is uh, a lot of the reasons why I would use it because you really want to line things up just right. You want things to space just right. And so when you want to start spacing things, you start thinking about justify content. And so in this case, I'm going to put my wrap back on because I need my elements to stay 150 and not get squishy. And so I'm going to come here and I'm going to go a little wider. And so I have justify content. Let's see, I have a flex start. So flex start is when it's a row, flex start is going to be on the left hand side of the container. Uh, what if it's a column? It's going to be at the top of the container. And so in our case, I could say flex start. See if I can get this a little bit narrower. We're gonna take away that and we'll go here. We'll go like that. Okay, so flex start, I could say flex end. Might actually decrease this one just a little bit. Yeah, okay. Cause it's more important to see how they interact together rather than seeing the specific numbers unless uh, you can't see the numbers, but we'll see that in just a second. And here I can say justify content, flex start. I can also say flex end. That takes everything. 
throws it to the end, shifts them all to the right. There's also a justify content called space around. Nope, don't wanna save that one. Save that one. Come here, I go to space around. This is starting to look a little bit more like a nav bar, just a little bit. You can see how we have five elements. They're all spaced evenly. One, two, three, four, and five, they all have the even space around each other. And then at the ends, there's not the same amount of space as you have in between the elements, but it's still even. The space that you have on the right hand of five or the left hand of one is the same. They're all just centered in a sense, but they're spaced uh, apart as the name suggests. Then there's this other one that uh, any fans of Dave Matthews from the 90s will like the space between. No one got my joke. Yeah, he did. All right, so with the space between. I'm sad to say that I got your joke. Yeah, hey, I'm not saying I had the record. I'm just saying I knew the song. So, and I think of it every time I do it. So yeah, and uh, yeah. And I think David also knew that because he's smiling too. And uh, yeah, awesome. And uh, so with the space between, it's really similar to space around, but notice how the first and last element they actually get knocked to the edges of the container, which this is the one I liked the most when I would use it. Cause that's like, oh, I could stick this element. I know it's gonna stay onto the side and that element's gonna stay on the side. And then it will space everything else evenly in between the two. So three, two, three, and four look really similar to space around, but that one and five, those are the ones living on the, living on the edge, essentially. Uh, let's see, so we have the space between you can also set up a flex flow, which is kind of a shorthand for saying uh, where you can set up a flex wrap uh, or I mean a flex wrap or a flex direction. In our case, we're just going to leave this here because, whoa, hi. Okay. Uh, and so we're going to leave this here so that we can kind of spell things out. That's how I like to learn when I'm learning things. I want to spell them out first. Then we can get all fancy and cool with the CSS all in one line later uh, when you start getting uh, more comfortable with it. All right, so we have justify content and flex direction, flex flow. Now let's think about flex align. So flex justify content is spacing things along the, the plane in which you are working. So in our case, if you're doing a flex row, justify content is spacing things along that row. If we were doing a column, if I came here and said column, Well, that didn't work, but that's because my container height is wrong. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So with that, you set your, your container. So your container actually has a set height. It does that space between still. We have it. It's set to the top, set to the bottom, and then spacing those elements all evenly in between two, three, and four are all even in between. In that case, we have, what if you have elements that are doing more than just, you know, you wanna center them or space them more than just on the row or just on the column in which you're working. That's done with something called flex align. So we'll come out of here and we're actually gonna use a different demo here because this is a, a little bit different uh, behavior that we have going on. So we have five elements going on here and with our flex direction, we have a flex row, we have a flex no wrap, I'm gonna have a justified content of center. We'll just see what that looks like real quick. It's gonna take all my elements. It's still keeping them on the top because we have a flex direction of row. And, uh, but it's still keeping things on the, the top of the, of the container there. And they're all mashed together. One, two, three, four is kind of looking funny. And then we got five floating right there. Now with align items, this is, arranging things on the cross axis. We could say align items. Oh, let's do something like stretch. Mm -mm -mm. Nope. All right, so let's do, 
if we did a flex start, I believe it's just going to kick us right back to where we are. But if a flex end, it's actually going to take our elements here and it's going to stick them on the bottom of the page or bottom of the container. In here, it looks a lot like a bar graph, like what we're, we're sitting here. We could do that and then maybe do a justify content uh, space around and then make it look kind of like a nice graph. So you can, again, we just arranged our five elements with setting a couple of different attributes on our container and it's done, which is nice. So we have that going on. And then there's this other interesting align items and I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna take away this justify content here real quick. I'm gonna set it back to center because in here, there's an align items called baseline. When I first heard a baseline, I thought that baseline would do this. What you're seeing on screen right now, I thought this would also, was also baseline because that's the baseline of the container. It takes all the elements, takes their bottom line, lines them on the baseline of your container. But actually, if we come here, notice what it did there. It actually started looking at the content inside of the item and aligned those baselines. So in our case, a lot of times you might have objects that have different sizes or different shapes, but you want to align like maybe the text or the images that are inside those items or inside those little turquoise containers. That's done with baseline and flex. So you can line those things up here. So, but the most wonderful thing about using Flexbox is that in HTML and CSS, the hardest, most terrible thing to ever try to do, especially before Flexbox, was centering things. So who ever enjoyed centering things? Yeah, no, right? Because you never knew. You never knew if it was centered. You always had to set up padding or measure the container or measure where it was or what, how it related to everything. But in our case, now we have these wonderful things where I can just say justify content. I can say align items and I can take my objects and now I just center them. Both things are just set to center. The container is essentially saying, take my five elements and put them in the middle and they're always going to be in the middle. So nice. So I love that about Flexbox. All right. So that is a little bit about the flex box idea. We talked about our containers and our items that were going on there. You want to keep in mind compatibility, although Flexbox is pretty widely used nowadays. If you have to support older browsers, keep in mind, go look it up, make sure that it it uh, it's supported in the browsers that you're you're building for. But uh, you just want to keep that in mind. But it, this these this day and age, Flexbox is usually pretty widely covered. So with Flexbox, we were able to lay things out on a single axis that we were talking about. We're, we're thinking things in, in essentially a single dimension, a little bit further than positioning things individually and applying styles to things individually. We're thinking about things in a group. However, now with CSS Grid, we're taking the idea of Flexbox and then essentially multiplying it another direction. So instead of just a single axis, we're gonna be thinking about aligning and laying out our elements on our HTML page in two directions, rows and columns and how they interact with each other, making cells and things like that. And if you've been in web development for a little while, you're thinking, wait, isn't that like tables and stuff? Yes, but no, right? Tables, HTML tables, are meant for a very specific thing. They're meant for tabular data, putting something in a grid. That makes total sense. If you're making using tables to lay out your page, you're gonna run into a lot of hurt when you start moving things around, when you start moving with different, uh, different media sizes, different monitor sizes, different window sizes. So CSS Grid introduces a more CSS way of doing that tabular or table type layout because this is how it was built for. So there's different, few different concepts inside of CSS Grid that we wanna talk about that's in addition to what you may already know and especially what we talked about with, with Flexbox. So with Flexbox, we had that container, we had items inside of that container. Inside of CSS Grid, we have rows, 
We have columns, makes sense. But we also have this space in between the rows and columns. It's called the gutter. And just keep that in mind that the gutter is that spacing that we have around the, the different elements inside of our grid. Inside that gutter, no matter how big you have it set, because you could have it set to nothing on your, on your CSS grid, you have lines. And this line concept and the line math that you'll have to do when you start using CSS grid is one of those learning curves. It, it's just a little steeper, at least for me, it was, a, it was not super straightforward right at first. You see here, we have a CSS grid that is, uh, has two rows and it has what, three columns. However, it has three lines on the horizontal and four lines on the vertical. The lines are not the cells themselves. It's not the row, it's not the column. It's the actual border of that row on that column. So in our case, when we're talking about the lines that are going horizontal, we have one line at the very top above our row. Then in between row one and two, we have that line two. And then we have line three down below it. This, these are used and it's, you'll see where it gets a little tricky and where we're gonna be using them. But what I do like is that most of the modern browsers, at least two of them we'll be looking at today, have great CSS grid inspector tools that let us see these numberings a little bit better and just understand how they're working just a little bit. So normally this is, I don't normally like to bring up religion in a technology talk. However, in technology, we have religions, right? Whether we're Apple, whether we're Google, whether we're Firefox, things like that. Me personally, I will fully admit, I am a full on Google person. I have an Android, I have Chrome, I have an Android watch. I am all in, I get that they have all my data and I actually don't really care. Although I'm starting to care a little bit. Except I have an exception and I still have an exception, even though Chrome does have this tool now. Firefox has an amazing Flexbox inspector tool. So not Flex and Flexbox, but also CSS grid. Sorry, we're talking about CSS grid. So it has an amazing CSS grid inspector tool. And so in this case, where we're gonna be doing some CSS grid demonstrations and some learning about CSS grid, I'm actually gonna be using Firefox. It's taking a lot, I promise. However, it's worth it. With that said, Fire, uh, Chrome is definitely catching up with their, with their uh, CSS grid inspector. And I do believe Safari, I'd be shocked if Safari doesn't because Apple has, within the last few years, hired one of the biggest resources in the industry uh, who, who uh, creates material about CSS grid in Jen Simmons. So I, I can't imagine Safari not having it now, but I haven't looked. So, but we're gonna look at uh, Firefox today. So in our case, we're going to uh, remember compatibility. We'll talk about compatibility here in a second, but I'm gonna pop over to Firefox, not look at our final there, but we're gonna look at this demo. Looks kind of similar to our Flexbox demo, uh, except for we're, we're dealing with a bigger layout. We're dealing with more things because our page layouts have a lot more things, especially we're looking at a grid we're thinking of our page holistically. We're starting to move even further and further out. Remember first we started talking about positioning and floating single elements and talking about single elements. Now, then we went talked about Flexbox was, was either a row or a column. And now we're moving out and looking at our whole page, looking at a whole grid inside of that page. So we wanna have 10 elements instead of five in, in our demonstration here. And so I have my grid here, that has my 10 elements. And then we're gonna set this grid up. And here, just to show, I have my, my HTML hasn't changed. We just added five more elements in, uh, to the mix here. And so I'm gonna come up here to my container and we're gonna say display grid. And in this grid, we're gonna set up our columns. And in our case, I'm gonna do this one right here real quick. We're gonna set up three columns of 100 pixels each. 
I'm gonna hit reload, and I have my three columns of 100 pixels each. Nicely laid out, even, good. My page is a little wide, so uh, that, that we'll have to fix that here in a second, but let's, let's look at a few other things first. Now, there's a couple other concepts you wanna think about when you're setting up your columns. And also, thinking about this also, you, you look at this grid, it takes a little bit of planning to set up CSS grid. You wanna think about, okay, how much my layout gonna be? And okay, I'm gonna have this many columns, this many rows, that type of thing. It's a good idea to, to sketch things out, have a general idea of what you're gonna do before you go into it, because once you start going in and start adding things, yeah, it's, it's possible, it's totally possible, but you, you're gonna start uh, working with, the, with these different concepts a little bit more. And so in this case, I have three columns here. I can say, well, actually I wanted four, so I could say four and really I wanted four and I wanted the middle two to be like 200 pixels each. Right, it's like, oh, okay. And so that's neat. And so we'll lay it out in a nice grid here. And so we have that in 200 pixels each. However, typing things out repeatedly might not be that much fun. And so there's another idea that we have where we could take our columns here, we can repeat it, but then we can also use a concept that which they call fractional ratios. These fractional ratios actually basically say, we're gonna create three columns and they're all within the same distance or the same size of each other is essentially what the fractional ratio is, is supposed to be. And so in our case here, I could say that I could save the page first and hit that. And now it's spreading them evenly. It's not just setting them into a, a specific 100 pixels. It's saying, all right, you have this much space and you want to do three columns and you want them all the same size. Great. So the fractional ratio is one, boom. And so you repeat it three times. So it's, we have our, with our columns here. And let's see, so with our columns, we have our gap. Our gap is that border, that gutter that I was talking about. And so if we come into here and have a 10 and a 20, similar to how we're setting up uh, our margins and our paddings before, we could sit here and say, well, actually I just want everything to be even. We'll take out the 20, make it 10. You saw it, it shifted just a little bit. But in our case, we want to really make it stand out a bit. So we're going to do 20 all the way around, make them separate from each other. Okay, that works nicely there. And so we have this going on and it looks nice and all, but how many of our pages are really a grid? Like a, a grid thing that we're actually seeing like a block and a block and a block and they're all exactly the same. Not usually. Right, not, that's not usually what's gonna happen. So what we wanna do is, well, what if I wanna take one of my cells and actually make it a little bit bigger? So that I have like some content here, some content here, but really I want a big piece of content, right? Going on right there. And all right, so that's when I'm gonna start thinking about those lines that we had going on. And so we're gonna span this across a couple of different uh, cells. So I have a class down here, it's called main. It's gonna make it, yellow, it's going to start at line one, and then it's going to end on negative one. Yep, that's weird. We'll talk about that in a second. And then it's going to start on row two, and then end on row four. When we looked at that picture before about where the line started and stopped, it's like, okay, Scott, uh, I don't see a whole lot going on, and I don't remember where those lines are. Well, that's when Firefox really comes into play. So we'll come into here, we'll say inspect. Let's do this here. And we come down to our grid, has this nice little grid button right here. You click on that grid button. We come up here, let's see if I can, that's probably a little small, a little bit better. And so I'm gonna do that. And with my grid button, I'm gonna say, let's display the line numbers. And then let's also, and I recommend this as you're getting started, extend lines all the way. That way you can see, okay, this is where my grid is, but then this is how the lines are going 
up into the white area or up into the background, which usually is a little easier to see. And so in my case, uh, I have my line one, it's extending to line negative one, okay? In our case, negative one is essentially the exact other side. It's uh, if you wanna start thinking in lots of negatives, you can. Negative one basically says you're gonna go all the way across. You could also just say line four, and I believe it'll do the same thing. In fact, let's play with it. We're gonna go off script and try that. So I'm gonna take my thing here and I'm gonna, let's take number, let's take number six, okay? And we're gonna make that main and it's gonna turn yellow and it should, right. So what it did here is started on line one, went to line four, started on line two of the rows and went to row four. All right, so, okay, that's nice and all, but I don't really love how it went all the way across. So I wanna take it, we're gonna take it down to line three. And then I wanna end it on row, there's six rows, right? There's six lines. So let's end it on line five. Now we have a little bit of a little bit better of our, our content going across the lines that we have set in our column and the lines that we have set in our row. And so with that, we can set up our grid a little bit using that grid math. And those lines are super interesting. Uh, they, they start getting interesting, especially as you're starting to try to figure out where things start, where things stop and how they relate to each other. Notice, that six, even though it was living way off on the right over here, we gave it a class that said, start at one. It basically put an element and put it exactly where we defined it and said, basically to all the other elements of the container, y'all figure out where to go, but you need to follow the rest of the rules. Six gets priority because we told it exactly B. And so six is there and then one, two, three, and then four, five, six, or then four, five, and then six is where it was seven, eight, nine, 10. They just fill in the rest of the space using the rules you already set inside your container. So with this grid, it, what I like about showing it here is it shows us a little bit about, okay, how my grid's gonna actually work, how my elements will work within each other, how the items interact with each other. But let's take it one step further to make it a touch more realistic. The next demo I'm gonna show, I always share a disclaimer because I'm a developer. I am not a designer. This is what happens when I am given a page to design. It looks like this, okay? So all of you designers out there, I'm sorry. I'm just, I, I'm working on that part of my skill set. You give me a design, I can absolutely develop it. Coming up with my own design, not something I do very well. And so, but in our case, I work at a company called PagerDuty. I'm a developer advocate. Developer advocates, what we do is we talk about our company's API and people building applications that interface with our, with our product, right? And so when I joined PagerDuty a few years ago, I noticed our developer documentation for our API looked a lot like this, honestly. It basically was essentially a lot of text and wasn't really readable and like i looked at it i got bored i didn't really read through the whole thing and so folks inside the company were like yeah i think that needs to be better and i was like yeah i think you're right it definitely needs to be better and so what i did is i took this concept it took the idea in fact this is a lot of the content we had on the page at the time and tried to make it a little more eye-catching and i wanted to use these concepts that we had with css grid and with Flexbox and make it work a little bit nicer uh, and look a little bit nicer. And so I'm gonna take this, this code here and here's the code on the left. We'll actually go full screen on the code for a second just to show it and then we'll go back to our, our demonstration. And so I have the code, it's all this straight HTML that we have a little bit uh, just uh, has some IDs and some classes, but not a lot of styles inside of the HTML itself. Because it's a little bit more complex of a page, the styles are gonna be on another file. And so we have that going on over here. And so we have our grid. 
Okay, so let's come over here. I wanted to make a grid straight up. And so I came here. Make this a little bit nicer so we can see both. Hopefully try to see both. All right, so we have our grid. Uh, we have our SDKs, okay, that, and uh, some webhook information and like stuff about integrating and uh, we have a fact section. So it seems a lot of the same stuff that you would have on a, on a just a documentation page that you wanna make a little more readable. In our case, if I just made my container for the whole page here, made it a grid. And then we're gonna create these columns. Let's do that here. I'm gonna make, I have four columns. They're gonna repeat. They're gonna be one fractional ratio, which means they're all gonna, they're just gonna take up the whole width of the page. All be the same width. I'm gonna just leave those there. Let's see what that does to our page here. Okay. So it gives us a few things made things bring it up a little bit right over the fold as they say and made it so that we can see more information when we load the page but that's not real readable and so we have our our grid we can click on our grid we can say display line numbers extend the lines indefinitely so we can see where those are going and so i'm things are really cramped so i'm gonna take my grid gap add that Okay, okay, okay. That looks a little bit better. Got my grid gap going on. Things are spaced a little bit more nice. All right. And now I'm going to have a, diff a few different areas. And so what we did before is we wanted, we didn't want to keep the same size of our different boxes. So in our case, my intro, I want to span across the page. So I'll give a grid column of one to five. That grid column is now a shorthand of where we had that grid column start, grid column end. You can just do the start slash end and make your grid column all defined in that same line. So I'm gonna have my overview section be from one to three. I'm gonna have my quick start be from three to five. The SDKs, we wanna have that go all the way across the page. And then our webhooks are going to be defined from on the left there. They're going to start from the left at one and then go to three. Going to reload that here and like, oh, okay, this is looking a little nicer. Got my, my introduction going on. I've got my, uh, let's see, look at the grid here. Show, yeah, we got the overlay grid. There we go. And we have our sections with our different areas going on. We have our SDKs, we have our quick start, um, and our overview, that's our overview, I believe, and then our quick start here. Then we have our SDK section, and then we have our webhooks. Notice we didn't define anything for these last two because we don't really care where they go. So they can just sit where they are and just fill in the rest of the space using the rules of the container. In this area, we can come down here, our SDK, our SDK section looks a little different. We can actually take this right here. Notice if we come down here to our SDKs and our HTML, and we have our flex box. We can say, we're gonna display flex. We're gonna do space between. We'll just leave that there. All right, yeah, see now we wanted the SDKs to pop, but we didn't want them to take up the whole page like they were taking. So now we have those living here, space between, nicely separated out here. And we have a page that uh, we could at least parse a little bit faster than just a long column of text. Now, before we end, I wanna show one more thing. Now, this thing is a little finicky. I'll, I'll, I'll be fully transparent about that, but it can be super cool. And so we're gonna use something called grid column areas or grid areas. And that's because how many of us really wanna sit there and think about how something starts in one, ends at five, or starts at three and ends at four, or trying to figure out where those lines are and how those lines should be set up and how I should do that line math when I'm setting up all my different grid columns. It gets tedious and you start kind of getting lost on where things go. The grid 
the the grid here, the grid tool, it's nice. It lets it, it gets us there. However, what if we wanted to take those different areas and give them names and then to understand, okay, I know where these names should live and I know how I want to, how I want to arrange them. So in our case, we're going to come here and we're going to take our container. We're going to do our webhooks and give it a grid area called webhook. We'll give our SDKs a name of SDK. Quick start's going to be quick. Overview, overview, and then intro is going to be intro. Notice how these names of these different areas are not strings. These are actual variable names. So don't put the thing that I got stuck on, honestly, for probably more than I wish to admit, maybe hours, is that these are not strings. Okay. So don't remember when you're setting up your grid areas, these are values and not strings. And so we have these set up. All these grid areas have a name. And so we think, okay, great. So how do I get those into my page? We do that by setting up a grid template areas. Now, I usually love VS Code. VS Code does something I don't like in this particular situation. Because in this situation, it's a lot easier to see this grid template areas, how it should be laid out. How it should be laid out is this. We have our intro. We have four areas for our intro. Then we're going to do an overview, overview, a quick and a quick. So the cells, the different cells that we have that we just named, it's going to take up those cells inside of the grid. Rather than trying to say the math of one, five, three, six, negative two, whatever, we're essentially drawing it out with these grid template area names. This is how I like to see it. This is how it should be seen in my opinion, because it, you can see how your page is laid out. I'm gonna leave that there for just a second so you can see how that's going. Because this is, for me, this I'm mentally like laying out my page saying, okay, this is where my different pages, my different elements are, my different areas. And I'm gonna have them defined in this grid template areas. But VS Code tries to be really helpful and put those all back on the same line. You can do a save without formatting, which is what I usually do. I just forgot to do it the last time I saved this file. So I will do save without formatting. Okay, and so now we have this here. Have my intro, 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 overview, overview, quick, quick, SDKs all the way across, and then webhooks across the other two. Notice I also have these dots. That's because when you start using this grid template areas idea, you need to take everything into account because if you don't, it gets super wonky. And so I have my page here. We'll reload. Good, good. Everything looks okay. I'm going to take this full screen so we can look at this a little bit because now I'm going to come in here to this other checkbox that I've been ignoring this whole time. And this is the display area names checkbox. So now I'm gonna come in here. And so remember how we named each of those areas? Now we have those names floating on our screen. So we have quick, quick, overview, overview, intro, 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 all across the page here. And then we come down here, our SDKs are going all the way across because we wanted those to go all the way across. And then webhooks took up two sections. So that's doing it that there. And these two sections, sadly, they had no names. And so they have no names on the page. And so in this case, but those are just there. And now we know these are our sections that don't have names. To show you what happens if you do that wrong, mention how, remember how I mentioned that that was finicky. Let's say I take out one of these dots. Kaboom. All right, so just know if you start seeing stuff do this and you're using the, that grid template name stuff, it's probably because your values aren't quite right. You don't have every element accounted for when you're doing the grid template areas. So make sure that you have that all set, everything's defined and everything's placed in that value. And then it can, everything goes back and looks pretty.
So that is something there. Remember compatibility. CSS Grid, again, probably most of the browsers these days handle it. Uh, they handle it pretty well. However, if you have to be using Internet Explorer 7, uh, there are add-ons uh, that are tools that allow you to use it. Auto Prefixer is a, is a project that allows you to use Grid and most of its elements inside of that browser. It must still be needed because when I went and looked at that GitHub project recently in the last few months, it had been updated within the last few months. So it's, it's something that's possibly still needed. Here are some of the uh, resources that I used when I got going on, on Flexbox and CSS Grid. I'll leave this here for a second and I can also share them in the chat or, or, or share them with uh, Nolan and, and get them out to the group. Uh, Jen Simmons is like the authority on CSS Grid. I believe she works for Apple nowadays, uh, but she is, has a lot of great, great information on CSS Grid. Also, uh, Rachel Andrews uh, does as well. She's like right up there with Jen Simmons. So definitely give their content uh, a look because it's, it's the best on getting going with CSS Grid, also with Flexbox. CSS Grid Garden is an awesome game environment that uh, allows you to play with essentially the grid math, the line math and like how to do that stuff. You can go through like a gamification on learning how to do CSS Grid. Uh, for, uh, Flexbox Froggy is also another one that does a lot of the similar things there. There is also, of course, the MDN Web Docs. The, essentially, the, the documentation for the web is, uh, has great content as well. And then the demos for the talks for the for this talk that I've been giving that's available on my GitHub repo there down at the bottom. I want to show, whoops, before we show me, I want to show Jen's site because it's super rad. So I'm going to come here. Ooh, that's not what we wanted. Let's just do this. Okay, labs. So this, turning sideways a little bit, if we look at this and say inspect inside of Firefox here, we come up to here and we find out that this right here is a grid. Jen Simmons took the grid and then turned it sideways. She does a lot of crazy cool stuff with layout. So definitely give her, her stuff a look uh, because it's it's definitely can get you going on CSS grid and uh, with Flexbox. More with grid, I think, with her. I think most of her stuff is grid, uh, but uh, she's great. But, all right. So thanks, y'all. I'm Scott McAllister, developer advocate at PagerDuty. I am um, grateful for you all sticking around and then listening to my talk today. You can find me on these various platforms that I have going on here. Twitter, even Mastodon, which is, seems to be a new thing, and uh, I'm giving it a shot. So it's down there at the bottom. You can find me on Mastodon there at, uh, at uh, the techhub.social. But as we say here at PagerDuty, I would like to wish all of you an uneventful rest of your day. Scott, thanks very much, man. That was fantastic. Thank you. Any questions or anything? There's nothing in the chat. Does anyone, if anyone has a question, uh, feel free to type it in the chat yourself or unmute your mic and um, just blurt it out. We don't have a crazy large group tonight. Uh, if I need to, I'll start meeting people, but um, go for it. If you have something you want to ask Scott while we're here. Um, I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you, Scott. Um, that was really helpful. Um, I, I actually used to work with you. Uh, this is Marvin. I'm not sure if you remember me, but uh <laughs> I was like, I know a Marvin, and you sound a lot <laughs> like him. How you doing, man? Doing great. Um, but I was wondering, in your experience, do you usually see people use CSS Grid and Flexbox together, or do they usually choose one or the other? I think they both have their own use cases, and so they use them together most of the time that I've seen, just because Flexbox is more for doing things on a single plane, and then Grid is doing things more holistically as a big thing. And so... You, you do the grid and then in each of those cells, you're going to be essentially uh, styling those cells how, you know, you need inside that cell. And a lot of times Flexbox will be used inside of there. 
I see. Thank you. Yeah. We had a couple people in the chat that asked similar questions to each other and then to that one. Um, they they both basically asked, how do you decide when to use grid versus when to use select box? Yeah, it's essentially like when are you when are you thinking about things in a row or as column, or are you trying to think about things in a row and column situation? And so when you're going two dimensions, then you're probably going to be doing grid. Uh, it's the single dimension stuff that you'll be doing uh, flexbox. Any other questions for Scott? Uh, we got one more in the chat. Sorry, this is off topic. Uh, Oops, it flew by. Let me read it real quick. Sorry. Um, no give me one second. Set of traffic. When do you decide to use uh, PX or EM or REM for your uh, sizes? Oh, that's a good question. I I don't know. For me specifically, I mean, it's kind of a preference thing, right? But I mean, in, in my mind, I use PX when I'm trying to be really, really precise uh, about things. And then REM is more when things are in relation to each other. And so if I just want like something to be, you know, two times a thing, then I use REM. But like, if I want it to be specifically 15 pixels, then you want to use that. But I, I that'd be a great question for the group. I think folks who have uh, experience also. Uh, I was just going to say, Bill, this sounds like something that maybe you would have a thought on, not to put you on the spot or anything, but. Sure, I'm happy to jump in if you want. Sure, um, go for it. REM is great when you want to relate everything in sizes to the document. And if you're working on a team of people, it can be really helpful to keep track of relative sizes of, of things, particularly font sizes and typography stuff with REM in relation to the document. Whereas M makes better use of uh, the cascade and relationships from one element to its parent, you know, between like a parent and child element. Um, I tend to prefer M's personally. I uh, was just talking about this with Glenda the other day, who's also on here, but um, I prefer M's personally just because I'm a bit of a purist and I like making use of the of the cascade and that sort of stuff. But if you're working on a team, REMS is for typography related stuff, kind of the standard these days. At one point I saw an article, this is, I don't know, maybe a year or more ago, where somebody went through and they had like designed these buttons that had very specific padding and spacing and all that kind of stuff and showed how with REMS, you can scale them up and down and all the elements kind of maintain their relationships really nicely. Um, uh, but I, I tend to prefer M's for typography. Um, like Scott, like when I'm putting gutters on a page, like I want them to be 20 pixels. Like I, you know, I want it to be specific. So that's a place where I tend to use pixels personally. I don't want a paragraph of text with like an expanding gutter, depending on how wide the page is, that that would drive me absolutely nuts as a designer. <laughs> so those are those are my thoughts offhand. I think we could totally have an entire SAC interactive presentation sometime on pixels versus M versus REMs and just get into details on how to put those together. So if anybody feels like putting that presentation together, um, shoot me a DM and we'll, we'll get you on the calendar for later this year. Uh, thank you, Bill. Um, Another question in the chat for you, Scott. Simone asked, do you use anything besides inspect to debug flex and grid problems? I don't. Um, yeah, I don't. Um, anyone else on the group that has experience with these use anything else? I, I the inspect, you. yeah, the, the CSS grid uh, inspector uh, has been, especially in Fle or Firefox, is really good. And so, and the one in Chrome is pretty decent. It's getting up there with it. Uh, there was something with it that I didn't quite like. So that's why I, I still keep showing off the, the Firefox one. And uh, so th those seem to be doing really well. I am team Firefox all the way. I'm with you on that one. There you go. Uh, we had one more um, uh, slightly off topic question, but um, 
another just personal preference thing people are curious about. Uh, Javier asked, uh, he's just wondering, do you always use .htm for your files instead of .html? If you have a reason no. for one versus the other. And I don't have a hard, fast rule either way. I'm not, I'm not uh, opinionated on that at all, actually. Yeah, same. I used to be .htm for ages and ages because I was so used to old Windows machines where you could not mm. have more than a three-letter extension on things. And now that I've just spent so many years in Mac and Linux environments as kind of my default place for developing code, um, I think more often than not, I go to .html now, and I don't feel weird about it anymore, whereas it took a long time for me to feel comfortable doing that because I spent so much time on old Windows boxes. Yeah. Yeah, I think... Uh... I think on this one, I just I kept it uniform at HTM because I don't even know why. I think I just did. It, it's just cool. it, it, like it's not one of those things. You know how like as developers, there's some things that we see in code. And we go, I, I have to change that. I have to change that. It, that's not one of those things for me. Yep. Where do you stand on curly braces? Do they go on their own lines vertically aligned or do they go at the end of the line and then... Um... They they go the the beginning one goes on the first on the the line of the with the it goes like if foo and then the curly brace goes right there not not below the i and if no not below at the end yeah Same. that I might change <laughs> <laughs> I have for years I was a they have to be vertically aligned hundred percent of the time guy and now mm -hmm. I have certain contexts where I'll do one and certain contexts where I'll do the other mm -hmm. um, it depends on what I'm working on. Anyway, we could start a whole battle with that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe we should stop that discussion now. I was going to say, <laughs> talking about religious conversations. Yeah. Right, seriously. Yeah, we're getting yeah. way into like, this is how nuclear bombs go off kind of kind of stuff where your curly braces go in code. That's yep. major. Um, Tabs versus spaces for indents. Right, oh, seriously. Geez. I knew oh, we were yeah. going to get there. Once we started talking about curly right? braces, I was like, oh, he's going to ask me tabs versus spaces. <laughs> exactly. Uh, one more question for you in the chat that just popped up. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce the name. I think it's Ecola. Uh, I apologize if that's wrong. Um, uh, this person said, do you prefer Bootstrap or do you write your own FlexGrid code? Bootstrap is awesome for what you need it for. And if it does what you need it to do, fantastic. Uh, I, I'm not against using Bootstrap at all or any other kind of uh, CSS framework. Uh, but as I, I've been teaching my... My son, my 14 year old son, he's been uh, learning how to code and, and things. It's been fun to kind of remember how to start, you know, and uh, I, I've really been trying to have him start with things that are not frameworks to understand it first and then get into the frameworks to then you appreciate the framework because you're like, oh, I slaved and slogged this whole thing and I could just pop this framework in and boop, it does the thing. And then when the framework breaks, you can go, oh, wait, that's weird. So, yeah. I agree with everything you just said and the two other reasons, if you don't mind me adding on to your answer, the two other reasons I would um, keep in mind of like writing your own code versus bootstrap are a lot of people um, when they do bootstrap, they just download the kitchen sink version of bootstrap, which is several large Huge. files. And that can add a lot of heavy weight to your project. If you're trying to keep your website snappy and make sure that it loads on in low bandwidth situations where people are out kind of, maybe outside and they don't have, um, you know, five bars worth of con of a 5G connection on their phone, the less CSS you have, the faster it will load in low data situations. Just make your, make your website uh, render and behave a little bit more quickly. Um, and the other thing people often do with Bootstrap is they download the kitchen sink version of it and then they don't learn the next step about how do I style this to make it look like my own branding and my own stuff. So you see a lot of websites out there where like, you load it up and like, oh yeah, that's clearly the default bootstrap button. The site is clearly using bootstrap. They didn't bother styling anything. It looks exactly the same. Even professional grade websites where I, I have accounts and do business on, on a regular basis, I can log on to them and go, that site uses bootstrap. There's one that Scott, you and I, I think spend a lot of time on um, for our music uh, collections. They're like, oh yeah, these guys are clearly using bootstrap. Yep. Um, I won't say that I'm here because I don't want to pick on them because I love the website, why they exist anyway. But I use it daily. And yeah, you same. must have been looking at one of my sites because I know I've used the default Bootstrap before. Oh, I've got sites that I use regularly <laughs> too. I, I did the same thing, download Bootstrap and just went nuts with it. I mean, it, like, it, gets you, it gets you really, like it gets you out of just looking like no styles into something that looks decent. You're like, okay, that works. And then you just move on. And, yeah. and that's, 
So, I mean, so, in those cases, it makes sense. But yeah, if, if you really want something to be like unique and look look good and also be performant, you want to make sure you know what you're doing when you're right. when you're uh, using the yeah. The Not that you can't be performant with Bootstrap. You absolutely can. Yes. But yes. you have to go in and like use the SAS files and like build your own version of Bootstrap that has the things you need and does not include all the stuff you're never going to use so that you have, rather than having like a half a gig of CSS, you have the little bits of CSS you actually are going to use in your website and then everything else just stays out in the cloud and doesn't um doesn't become part of your website overload right or overhead rather yeah cool um any other questions from anyone before we wrap it up here yeah i had a one more slightly off topic question um so i'm just i'm barely getting like I, i'm pretty good with css but there's like um when you i'm doing like tutorials online to learn how to like build new things they're always using different like frameworks like Tailwind or Pico. Um, what would you consider like the modern way to to um, to uh, implement CSS? I would defer to Nolan or Bill or others. I'm I haven't been doing modern uh, new development on things uh, mm -hmm. lately. I can only speak for the context of what I've. What I'm working on right now, I think um, mm -hmm. my current projects uh, are half um, homegrown CSS and the other half are bootstrap with some level of customization on top of them is what we've gone with. I've looked at Tailwind a handful of times. Mm -hmm. um, I personally don't feel I'm as efficient as a developer using Tailwind with the, the process of how you add Tailwind to your, your project as I am. And if I use Bootstrap or something else that works the Bootstrap way, that's just my, for my personal workflow. So I'd, I've tried Tailwind a couple of times and just haven't had that light bulb moment of we're like, oh yeah, this is great. And this is a way better way to do it than Bootstrap. So I, okay. um, I don't use those. Bill, do you have any um, CSS can preferences you, on that sort of thing? Can you just repeat the question again real quick? I was typing in the chat. Uh, yeah, so um, when I'm doing tutorials online, they use different different frameworks, Tailwind, Pico, stuff like that. And I was just wondering, like, uh, if I'm going to invest my time or or spend time trying to learn it, um, is it even worth learning it, or um, if I should just stick to something like like what he said, like just conventional CSS or uh, or Bootstrap? Um, I think I already said before I'm a purist. I think you should learn CSS. Um, okay. You know, I think you should, especially with, especially now with the grid stuff, you know, like mm -hmm. the, all the, all the sort of layout stuff that's built into bootstrap is so much easier to do. Like you can spin up your own layouts so much easier now with the stuff that Scott showed you tonight. Um, and okay. a lot of that stuff just isn't as necessary anymore. And um Tailwind, I just absolutely makes me want to vomit. So I just, uh, <laughs> that is just absolutely horrible stuff from, in my opinion. But, you know, obviously if you get hired on a team that's using Tailwind, you're going to have to learn mm -hmm. Tailwind. So, okay. um, you know, you're going to, you'll use the tools that the team you're working with is using. Um, but I, I think, you know, while you're learning stuff, you should, you should learn you should learn the the actual languages, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. I mean, those are the three things that make up every web page. That, okay. that's, that's my opinion. I have noticed, and actually uh, Rob, who's one of our co-organizers was talking the other day, he was looking through some of the LinkedIn learning videos and was sort of talking about how some of these platforms, when they teach front-end development, like have you install Node and like install all this, extra sort of tooling stuff rather than you know you spend all this time kind of setting up your environment in like three or four videos and he was sort of um complaining about like how all that stuff isn't really necessary to teach the things they're teaching so i don't know if that's where you're going for some of this stuff but yeah. i do think that some of those some of those training materials are out there where people kind of spend a bunch of time setting up special tooling environments that are their own personal preference. It's not really okay. necessary. Yeah, that answers my question. Thank you. I have looked at Pico and it looks awesome. I mean, that one's like really bare bones. It doesn't add a lot of um, extra markup in your files, which I, which is what I can't stand about Bootstrap and 
what makes me want to vomit with um, the tailwind. <laughs> A good point that Bill did make that, that I want to also reiterate, though, is as you get into to development, we do adapt. We adapt to what our teams use. And so it, it, it's being prepared to adapt, I think, is, is uh, an important skill to have as an engineer. 100% okay. agree. Always learning new stuff is just kind of yeah. par for the course with this um, type of job. Uh, David, you had your hand up. Do you have a question for yeah, Scott? Yeah, just to piggyback on that. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, Bill, I, I've wondered, you know, it, it, sometimes I feel like these things like Bootstrap are were more useful back before we had Flexbox and Grid. And now that we do, you know, I've spent, just like you were saying, I spent a lot of time really getting to know Flexbox, took a course in it online, and I took a, a, a Grid course online. And once you take those courses, they're not that hard. And I kind of go... Do we really need bootstrapping? I can understand where when you were floating things, mm. you know, and then you had to clear floats. And so there's all this overhead and a little bit of messiness there. It kind of made sense. So, but in modern times, it's it feels like with grid and flexbox, I, I'm not sure why teams do that, other than maybe, maybe it's because of um um I don't know, keeps the team in sync, all using the same style sheet. Kind of yeah. thing. I think for teams working on a project, it gives everybody a, a baseline that they're all working off of. And I think right. that really speeds up development. Yeah. You know, I have the privilege of not having to pump out 15 websites a week um, as a job. So, you know, I don't have to, um, I don't have to do that. So, you know, for those teams that really need to produce quickly, you know, and they don't really care so much that all their websites look like bootstrap. They're just trying to get them out the door. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a different thing. Yeah. And then, and then, and then um, just to piggyback on that last question, uh, and, and I have similar thoughts about what I'm about to ask is what I just said. Um, less SCSS, SAS. Um, you know, I, I find basic, uh, we'll call it vanilla CSS, not that hard to write. And so, is there, do you find any value in any of those? And, and if so, do you find any of those to be the most useful of the, you know, less SCSS and SAS? Nolan, I, th I think you use any, SAS. Any of you guys. I, um, I find, uh, so the one we're currently using a little bit, I think is SAS on the, the project that he's not right now on mine. Um, mm -hmm. That was, mm -hmm. Not my choice that was made by another developer on the team. I'm not against it by any stretch. I just don't want to deal with questions of like, why did you pick that? I didn't pick it. It was the only person that dropped it in there. Um, yeah. I am the kind of CSS developer that will uh, forget how to make everything cascade down properly. So like I'll set a font at what I think is the parent thing and all of my individual divs and sub divs inside the page should all magically get the font that I set up here and or the color or the background or whatever the thing is. And I'm always a guy that's like, this will work fine and trickle down into the five nested tags I have. And somehow it doesn't. And I mm -hmm. like SAS and tools like that because I can set a property at the top and I can just do the indent thing all the way down. And it seems to work better for my brain to where if I set a thing at the parent level and then all the indented stuff below it does actually trickle down more successfully in my experience. Um, I am not an expert CSS developer. I am the CSS developer that can eventually get the thing to work after various bits of trial and error. Mm -hmm. um, anything more complex, uh, I have a designer UX person. I go, you do this. And I think it either. So I, I like SAS for that level of making my head hurt less. Um, <laughs> I'm sure the less compiler and the, uh, whatever the third one is called, um, they all probably do the same, you know, thing for me if I, if I needed to, but that's my extent of, of using them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That being said, I freaking hate languages that are white space dependent. And the fact that I have to actually indent lines in SAS to make it work properly ticks me off to no end. Um, that's also why I hate Python and other things for the same reason. It's like, we have curly braces for a reason, people. Let me use them. But that's my own personal uh, pain. There's a lot of features in SAS that are coming to, you know, have are in vanilla CSS now and the rest are coming shortly, really. 
you know, a lot. I think, but again, you know, if you're on a team that's using SAS, then you're going to learn how to use SAS. You know, it's, yeah. it's one of those things where you'll use it if you if you're on a team that's building stuff with it, and it's not that hard to learn. So if you know CSS, the, the the hardest thing about it is that you know you have to compile something that's going to generate the CSS, and you have to remember. Yeah. Anytime you go to debug something, you have to you know follow it back up that chain. Um, Whereas if you're writing your CSS directly, then you know you've got one fewer steps to follow a problem back through. Um, but if you're working on a team, I think again with SAS and less, those tools do really help standardize the way teams write CSS. So it's much easier to read other people's code. Um, yeah. Yeah, with, without knowing it at all, when I see SAS or or even SCSS in CodePen, it's pretty easy to read. You know, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, Akla, did you have a question too? You have your hand up. Yes. And I hope uh, I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah, uh, actually, my name is Akilesh Akula. Uh, Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I had a question. Uh, this is slight off topic. So uh, there is something called style components, right? So we write the CSS, but now it's like very popular to use style components. So what's your uh, thought on the style components? I use style components, but I found it like difficult to for the time of debugging, especially. So right now, if you see the developer tools where I can slightly see the CSS classes, but the style components generates its own CSS classes, which I feel it's kind of difficult. Uh, I just want to hear your thoughts as well. I don't have any experience with them, Bill. I'm not sure exactly when you're talking about style components. Are you thinking about like using Sorry. CSS in an object oriented? You know, is that sort of the object oriented CSS kind of thing? Uh, style comes. I think, but right now we have a div and span as a element uh, names, right? So in React, uh, they use the uh, element name itself as a predefined name. So in general, if you have a, like a div, you have a class name equal to some app or something. So we can combine both together and name it as a like, a, mm, suppose say uh, uh, Twitter header as a name itself. And uh, you can name this in the CSS and define your styles. I don't know whether- well, I'm a terrible person to talk to about React because I hate that even more than- <laughs> <laughs> are you talking about trail, HTML I mean, web the components? The notion of like writing yeah. all your HTML and your CSS and your JavaScript to me is just like the worst idea since I don't know square wheels on your car. I, I just think it's just I, I don't know. I know React is super popular, and there must be somebody here who can tell who can help me understand why it is because I just think it's like the worst thing possible. <laughs> are you are you referring to like plain HTML web components? Is that what these are? It's a, oh. it's a React thing. It's, 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 it's right. basically, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's basically essentially the React taking CSS and JavaScript, kind of push, putting them together, essentially. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, okay. And, and, yeah. Nice. And then you, you have like inline styles inside of a, a JavaScript object sort of thing. I don't have any experience with it. I've heard of them, but I, I don't have any experience with it. I have not used those either. We have a regular attendee at the group named Corbin, who much to my surprise is not here this evening and he's a React dude. Um, so I'm gonna use this as an excuse to message Corbin later and be like, why were you not at the meeting tonight? There was a right. question that was totally up your alley. You can help us out, but um, uh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, we can't be more helpful with you on that one. Yep. No, it is. Um, Which is an example I just wanna point out to folks, especially as folks getting started, nobody knows all the things about all the things right mm -hmm. don't don't feel like you you're like oh i'm not good enough to do this like no 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 no. you're good it's like you, you know what you know but know what you don't know and then just keep going and yeah. you'd be like okay like right now i'm like okay i'll leave this tab open and make sure i kind of look at what this style components thing is later 100 percent. yeah good developers don't know all the answers they just know where to get the answers that they need and they'll figure it out and that list always changes like Totally. The the stuff I learned in college for my computer science degree, almost all of it completely irrelevant now. But the concepts yeah. of like, okay, why one type of algorithm is faster than another archetype of algorithm in this situation, those, you know, the concepts and the fundamental stuff, that all still is true. 
Um, math is not going to change, but I might be typing a C++ file, or I might have been doing that, you know, X number of years ago, whereas now I might be typing a JavaScript file or a Python file or something else to do whatever the thing is. But the the math and the reason why bubble sort is slow in most situations is still true, whether I'm in Python or in C++ or something else. So, um, yeah, all the good developers are always learning the new, just always keep learning new things. If you stop learning and you're only doing whatever people did 10 years ago, your ability to um, demand higher salaries and your ability to have a wide variety of jobs available to you is just gonna get smaller over time. So yeah, always learn new stuff. Don't be, and you're never gonna know everything, but that's just, that's the way this industry works. Yep. We're all in the same boat. Um, all right, we have kept Scott here a long, long time. Um, thank you very much, dude. That was fantastic. I'm glad we had so many people come out and uh, check out the presentation. We'll get this edited and put up on YouTube shortly. Um, just look for the Sac Interactive YouTube channel. And uh, when we get that up, we'll post it on our, our Facebook and Twitter and all that sort of things. So you can check out the recording there, everyone, if you want to um, check that out later. Uh, again, Bill and myself run this group every third Wednesday of the month. It's always free. It's always here in Zoom, at least for the time being, eventually, hopefully in Zoom and in person at somewhere in downtown Sacramento. We're always looking for people that want to speak, and we're always looking for topic ideas. If you have either one of those, please feel free to message Bill or myself. And if you'd like to be on our mailing list, please message us as well. You can also go to sacinteractive.com. You can find SAC Interactive on Twitter and Facebook as well, if you want to just um, check those out and look for the next meeting. And with that, I think we're done. I'll, I'll hit the stop button and we'll take off.